With my soul I have desired thee in the night. Welcome back to the Hackberry House, a daily podcast devoted to the Word of God and the persecuted Church of North Korea. My name is Bob, and this is podcast number 195. It's June 23, 2015. Today we begin a new message by Charles Spurgeon about how the true believer goes after God, even when the sun is not shining so brightly or at all in his life. Here's part one of that message. Today, a message from Charles Spurgeon entitled The Desire of the Soul in Spiritual Darkness. It was delivered on Sabbath morning, June 24, 1855 at New Park Street Chapel, Southwark in England. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Isaiah 26, 9. Night appears to be a time peculiarly favorable to devotion. Its solemn stillness helps to free the mind from that perpetual din which the cares of the world will bring around it. And the stars, looking down from heaven upon us, shine as if they would attract us up to God. I know not how you may be affected by the solemnities of midnight, but when I have sat alone musing on the great God, and the mighty universe, I have felt that, indeed, I could worship him, for night seemed to be spread abroad as a very temple for adoration, while the moon walked as high priest amid the stars, the worshippers, and I myself joined in that silent song which they sang to God, Great art thou, O God, great in thy works, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? I find that this sense of the power of midnight not only acts upon religious men, but there's a certain poet whose character perhaps I could scarcely too much reprobate, a man very far from understanding true religion, one whom I say, uh, may say, I suppose, justly style an infidel, a libertine of the worst order. And, and yet, <laughs> he says concerning night, in one of his poems, quote, "'Tis midnight on the mountains brown, the cold round moon shines deeply down. Blue roll the waters, blue the sky, spreads like an ocean hung on high." Bespangled with those isles of light, so wildly, spiritually bright, whoever gazed upon them shining and turning to earth without repining, nor wished for wings to flee away and mix with their eternal ray. <clears throat> Even with the, and that was the end of quote, Even with the most irreligious person, a man farthest from spiritual thought, it seems that there's some power in the grandeur and stillness of night to draw him up to God. I trust many of us can say, like David, I've thought upon thee continually. I've mused upon thy name in the night watches, and with desire have I desired thee in the night. But I leave that thought altogether. I, I shall not speak of night natural at all, although there may be a great deal of room for poetic thought and expression, I shall address myself to two orders of persons and shall endeavor to show that what I conceive to be the meaning of the text. May God make it useful uh, to you both. First, I shall speak to confirmed Christians, and from this text I shall bring one or two remarks to bear upon their case if they are in darkness. Second, I shall speak to newly awakened souls and try if I can, can find some of them who can say, with my soul have I desired thee in the night. <clears throat> first, I am about to address this text to the more confirmed believer. And the first fact I shall deduce from it, the truth of which I am sure he will very readily admit, is that the Christian man has not always a bright shining sun. 
that he has seasons of darkness and of night. True, it is written in God's word, her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. And it is a great truth that religion, the true religion of the living God, is calculated to give a man happiness below as well as bliss above. But notwithstanding, experience tells us that if the course of the just be as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day, yet sometimes that light is eclipsed. At certain periods, clouds and darkness cover the sun, and he beholds no clear shining of the daylight, but walks in darkness and sees no light. Now, there are many who have rejoiced in the presence of God for a season. They have basked in the sunshine God has been pleased to give them in the earlier stages of their Christian career. They've walked along the green pastures by the side of the still waters, and suddenly, in a month or two, they find that glorious sky is clouded. Instead of green pastures, they have to tread the sandy desert. In the place of still waters, they find streams brackish to their taste and bitter to their spirits, and they say, surely, if I were a child of God, this would not happen. Oh, Say not so, thou who art walking in darkness. The best of God's saints have their nights. The dearest of his children have to walk through a weary wilderness. There's not a Christian who has enjoyed perpetual happiness. There is no believer who can always sing a song of joy. It's not every lark that can always carol. It's not every star that can always be seen. And not every Christian is always happy. Perhaps the king of saints gave you a, a season of great joy at first because you were a raw recruit and he would not put you into the roughest part of the battle when you had first enlisted. You were a tender plant and he nursed you in the hothouse till you could stand severe weather. You were a young child and therefore he wrapped you in furs and clothed you in the softest mantle. But now... Now you've become strong, and the case is different. Capuan holidays do not suit Roman soldiers, and they would not agree with Christians. We need clouds and darkness to exercise our faith, to cut off self-dependence, make us put more faith in Christ, and less in evidence, less in experience, less in frames and feelings. The best of God's children, I repeat it again for the comfort of those who are suffering depression of spirits, have their nights. Sometimes it is a night over the whole church at once, and I fear we have very much of that right now. There are times when Zion is under a cloud, when the whole fine gold becomes dim, and the glory of Zion is departed. There are seasons when we do not hear the clear preaching of the word, when the doctrines are withheld, when the glory of the Lord God of Jacob is dim, when his name is not exalted, when the traditions of men are taught instead of the inspirations of the Holy Ghost. And such a season is that when the whole church is dark, of course, each Christian participates in it. He goes about and weeps and cries, O God, How long shall poor Zion be depressed? How long shall her shepherds be dumb dogs that cannot bark? Shall her watchmen be always blind? Shall the silver trumpet sound no more? Shall not the voice of the gospel be heard in her streets? There are seasons of darkness to the entire church. God grant we may not have to pass through another, but that starting from this period, the sun may rise never to set until a, like, a, like a sea of glory the light of brilliance shall spread from pole to pole. At other times this darkness over the soul of the Christian rises from temporal uh, distresses. He may have had a misfortune as it is called. Uh, something's gone wrong in his business or an enemy has done somewhat against him. Death has struck down a a favorite child. 
Bereavement has snatched away the darling of his bosom. The crops are blighted. The, the winds refuse to bear his ships homeward. A vessel strikes upon a rock. Another founders. All goes ill with him. And like a gentle man who called to see me this week, he may be able to say, Sir, I prospered far more when I was a worldly man than I have done since I have become a Christian. For since then... Everything has appeared to go wrong with me. I thought, he said, that, that religion had the promise of this life. <clears throat> this life as well as of the one which is to come. I told him, yes, yes it had. And so it should be in the end. But he must remember, there was one great legacy which Christ left his people. And I was glad he had come in for a share of it. He says, in the world you shall have tribulation. In me, you shall have peace. Yes, you may be troubled about this. You may be saying, look at so-and-so. See how he spreads himself like a green bay tree. He, he's an extortioner, a wicked man. Yet everything he does prospers. You may even observe his death and say there are no bands in his death. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Ah, beloved, you come into the sanctuary of God this morning, and now you shall understand their end. God has set them in slippery places, but he casts them down to destruction. Better to have a Christian's day of sorrow than a worldling's day of mirth. Better to have a Christian's sorrows than a worldling's joys. Ah, happier to be chained in a dungeon with a pall than reign in the palace with an Ahab. Better to be a child of God in poverty than a child of Satan in riches. Cheer up, then, thou downcast spirit, if this be thy trial. Remember that many saints have passed through the same, and the best and most eminent believers have had their nights. But, oh, says another, you, you have not described my night, sir. I have not much amiss in business, uh, I wouldn't care if I had, but I have a night in my spirit. Oh, sir, says one, I, I have not a single evidence of my Christianity now. I was a child of God, I know. But something tells me that I am none of his now. There was a season when I flattered myself that I knew something about godliness and God. But now I doubt whether I have any part or lot in this matter. Satan suggests that I must dwell in endless flames. I see no hope for me. I'm afraid I'm a hypocrite. I think I have imposed on the church and upon myself also. I fear I am none of his. When I turn over God's scriptures, there's no promise. When I look within, corruption is black before me. Then the, the, while others are commending me, I'm accusing myself of all manner of sin and corruption. I could not have thought that I was half so bad. I'm afraid there cannot have been a work of grace in my heart, or else I should not have so many corrupt imaginations of filthy desires, hard thoughts of God, so much pride, so much selfishness, self-will. I'm afraid I, I am none of his. Now, this is the very reason why you are one of his, that you are able to say that for God's people pass through the night. They have their nights of sorrow. I love to hear a man talk like that. I would not have him do so always. He ought at times to enter into the, the liberty which with which Christ has made him free. But I know that frequently bondage will get hold of the spirit. But you say, surely no one else suffers like that ever. I confess I do myself constantly. Very often there are times when I could not prove my election in Jesus Christ, nor my adoption, though I rejoice that for the most part I can cry, a debtor to mercy alone of covenant mercy I sing. Yet at other seasons I'm sure the meanest lamb in Jesus' fold I reckon ten thousand times more in advance than myself. And if I might but sit down on the meanest bench in the kingdom of heaven and did but know I was in, 
I would barter everything I had, and I do not believe there ever existed a Christian yet who did not now and then doubt his interest in Jesus. I think when a man says, I never doubt, it's quite time for us to doubt him. It's quite time for us to begin to say, ah, poor soul, I'm afraid you're not on the road at all. For if you were, you would see so many things in yourself, and so much glory in Christ, more than you deserve, that you'd be so much ashamed of yourself as even to say, and that's too good, too good to be true, that Christian men very frequently have their nights. But the second thing here is that a Christian man's religion will keep its color in the night. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. What a mighty deal of silver slipper religion we have in this world. Men will follow Christ when everyone cries, Hosanna, Hosanna. The multitude will crowd around the man then, and they'll take him by force and make him a king when the sun shines, when the soft wind blows. And they're like the plants on the rock, which sprang up and for a little while were green. But when the sun had risen with fervent heat, straightway withered away. Demas and Mr. Hold the World and a great many others are very pious people in easy times. They'll always go with Christ by daylight and will keep in company so long as fashion gives religion the doubtful benefit of its patronage. But they will not go with him in the night. There are some goods whose color you can only see by daylight. There are many professors, the color of which you can only see by daylight. If they were in the night of trouble and persecution, you'd find that there's very little in them. They're good by daylight, but bad by night. But, beloved, do you not know that the best test of a Christian is the night? The nightingale, if she would sing by day, when every goose is cackling, would be reckoned no better a musician than the wren. A Christian, if he only remains steadfast by daylight, when every coward is bold, what would he be? There'd be no beauty in his courage, no glory in his bravery. But it's because he can sing at night, sing in trouble, a sing when he's driven well nigh to despair. It's this which proves his sincerity. It has its glory in the night. The stars are not visible by daylight, but they become apparent when the sun is set. There's full many a Christian whose piety did not burn much when he was in prosperity, but it will be known in adversity. I've marked it in some of my brethren now present, when they were in deep trial not long ago. I had not heard them discourse much about Christ before. But when God's hand had robbed them of their comfort, I remember that I could discern their religion infinitely better than I could before. Nothing can bring our religion out better than that. Grind the diamond a little, you'll, you'll, you'll see it glisten. And do but put a trouble on the Christian, and his endurance of it will prove him to be of the true seed of Israel. Number three, a third remark from this uh, to the confirmed Christian is all that the Christian wants in the night or needs in the night is his God. With desire, I have desired thee in the night. By day, there are many things that a Christian will desire besides his Lord. But in the night, he wants nothing but his God. I cannot understand how it is unless, unless it is to be accounted for by the corruption of our spirit. That when everything else goes well with us, we're setting our affection first on this object and then on another and then on another and... And that desire, which is as insatiable as death and as deep as hell, never rests satisfied. We're always wanting something, always desiring a yet beyond. But if you place a Christian in trouble, you'll find that he does not 
need gold then. Doesn't need carnal honor. That's when he wants his God. I suppose uh, he's like the sailor when he sails along smoothly. He, he loves to have fair weather. And he wants this. And that to, that to amuse himself, uh, he has this and that on the deck. But when the winds blow, all that he wants is the haven. He doesn't desire anything else. Now, the biscuit may be moldy. He doesn't care. The water may be brackish. He doesn't care. He does not think of any of that in the storm. He only thinks about the haven then. It's just so with the Christian. When he's going along smoothly, he wants this and that comfort. He's aspiring after this position or is wanting to obtain this and that elevation. But let him once doubt his interest in Christ. Let him once get into some soul distress and trouble so that it is very dark. And all he will feel then is, with desire have I desired thee in the night. When the child is put upstairs to bed, it, it may lie while, while the light is there. And look at the trees that shake against the window and admire the stars that are coming out. But when it gets dark and the child is still awake, it cries for its parent. It cannot be amused by aught else. So in daylight will the Christian look at anything. He'll cast his eyes around on this pleasure and on that pleasure, but, but when the darkness gathers, it is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or, or why, why are you so far from me and, and from the world and the word of my roaring? Then it is, Give me Christ or else I die. These can never satisfy. Number four. One more remark before I leave my address to confirmed saints. That is, there are times when all the saints can do is to desire. We have a vast number of evidences of piety. Some are practical. Some are experimental. Some are doctrinal. And the more evidences a man has of his piety, the better, of course. We like a number of signatures to make a deed more valid, if possible. We like to invest property in a great number of trustees in order that it may all be all the safer. So we love to have many evidences. Many witnesses will carry our case at the bar better than a few. And so it is well to have many witnesses to testify to our piety. But there are seasons when a Christian cannot get any of that. He can get scarcely one witness to come and attest his godliness. He asks for good works to come and speak him, but there will be such a cloud of darkness about him and his good works will appear so black that he will not dare to think of their evidences. He will say, true, I, I hope this is the right fruit. I hope I've served God, but I dare not plead these words as evidences. He will have lost assurance and with it his enjoyment of communion with God. I've had that fellowship with him, perhaps he will say, and he'll summon that communion to come and be in evidence, but he's forgotten it and it does not come. And Satan whispers it is a fancy. And the poor evidence of communion has its mouth gagged so that it cannot speak. But there's one witness that very seldom is gagged, one that I trust the people of God can always apply, even in the night, and that is, I have desired thee. I have desired thee in the night. Yes, Lord, if I have not believed in thee, I have desired thee. And if I, I have not spent and been spent in thy service, yet one thing I know, and the devil cannot beat me out of it, I have desired thee, that I do know. And I have desired thee in the night too, when no one saw me, when troubles were round about me. Now, my beloved, I hope that there are many of you here this morning who are strong in faith. You do not perhaps need what I have said, but... I'll advise you to take this cordial and, 
If you do not want to drink it now, put it up in a small file and carry it about with you until you do. You don't know how long it may be before you are faint. And as Mr. Greatheart gave Christian a bottle of wine to take, uh, Christiana that is, a, a bottle of wine to take with her so that she could drink when she was fatigued, so you, you take this and don't laugh at a poor despised believer because he's not so strong as yourself. You may need this yourself some day. I tell you, there are times when a Christian will be ready to creep into a mouse hole if he might but get into heaven. When he would be glad to throw anything away to get into the smallest crevice to escape from his fears. When the meanest evidence seems more precious than gold. And when the very least ray of sunlight is worth all the riches of Peru. And when a little bit of comfort is more sweet than a whole heaven of it may have been at other seasons. You may be brought into the same condition. So take this passage with you and have it ready. Have it ready to plead at the throne with desire. I have desired thee in the night. And now, part two, the, the second part of my sermon is to be occupied by speaking to newly awakened souls. And as I have made four remarks to confirmed Christians, I will now endeavor to answer three questions to those who are newly awakened. The first question they would ask me is this, how am I to know that my desires are proofs of a work of grace in my soul? And some of you may say, I, I think I can go so far as the text. I have desired God. I know I have desired to be saved. I've desired to have an interest in the blood of Jesus. But how am I to know that it is a desire sent of God? And how can I tell whether it will end in conversion. Hear me then while I offer one or two tests. First, you can tell whether your desires are of God by their constancy. Many a man, when he hears a stirring sermon, has a very strong desire to be saved. But he goes home and forgets it. He, he's like a man who sees his face in a glass, a mirror, goes away and straightway forgets what manner of man he is. He returns again. Once more the arrow sticks hard in the heart of the king's enemy. He goes home only to extract the arrow and his goodness is as the morning cloud. And as the early dew, it passes away. Has it been so with you? Have you had such a desire? Will tomorrow's business take it away? Are you wanting Christ today? Will you despise him Tomorrow, then I'm afraid your desires are not of God. They're merely the desires of a naturally awakened conscience, just the stirrings of mere nature, and they'll go as far as nature can go, and no farther. But if your desires are constant, one takes comfort. How long have they lasted? Have you been desiring Christ this last month or these last three or four months? Have you been seeking him in prayer for a long season? Do you find that you're anxious after Christ on Monday as well as on Sunday? Do you desire him in the shop when the intervals of business allow you to do so? Do you seek him in the night? In the solemn loneliness when no minister's voice breaks on your ear? When no truth is smiting your conscience? Is it but the hectic flush of the consumption that has come upon your cheek, which is not the mark of health, or is it the real heat of a true desire which marks a healthy soul? Are you desiring God constantly? I admit there will be variations even to our more sincere desires, but a certain measure of constancy is essential to their real value as evidences of a divine work. Again, number two, you may discern whether they are right or wrong by their efficacy. Some persons desire heaven very earnestly, but they do not desire to leave off drunkenness. 
They desire to be saved, but they do not desire salvation enough to shut their shops up on Sunday morning or to bridle their tongues and leave off speaking ill of their neighbors. They desire salvation, but they do not desire it enough to come sometimes on the weekday to hear the gospel. You may tell the truthfulness of your desires by their efficacy. If your desires lead you into real works, meet for repentance, then they come from God. Wishes, you know, are not unless they're carried out. Many say unto you, shall seek to enter in, but shall not be able. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Seeking will not do. There must be striving. Our prophet here informs us that whilst he desired God in the night, that desire was very efficacious. For in the 18th verse he declares, In the way of thy judgments, O Lord, we have waited for thee. This desire made me wait for thy judgments. How many do I hear say, I am waiting for God, it is all I do. There I lie at the pool of Bethesda, and one of these days an angel will come and stir the pool. Stop. How do you know you are not deceiving yourself? There's a friend waiting for me to tea. I, I'll step into the room. There's no kettle on the fire. Not a bit for me to eat. Sir, we've been waiting for you, but there's nothing ready in the house. I don't believe them. They could not have been waiting for me or else they would have been ready. And waiting for God always implies being ready. A man says, I'm waiting for God, but he's not ready for God at all. He still keeps on his drunkenness. The house is still unswept. He's as worldly as ever. He's waiting, yes, but waiting implies being ready. And nobody is waiting that is not ready. You're not waiting for the coach until you have your coat and hat on ready to start and looking out the door for it. And you're not waiting for God till you're ready to go with God. No man ought to say, I'm waiting for God. No, no, beloved, it is God who's waiting for us generally, rather than any of us waiting for him. No sinner can be beforehand with him. But the prophet waited in the ways of God's judgment, that is, waited in the right place, waited in the house of God, waited under the sound of this gospel. And then this desire led him to seek. With my spirit within me will I seek thee. It led him to seek after God. Oh, the poor, pitiful desires of some of you are very little good. An old writer says, hell is paved with good intentions. I was not aware that there was any pavement at all, because it has no bottom. But at the same time, I believe that the sides of the pit are hung round with good intentions. And men will feel themselves pricked and goaded from side to side with good designs that they once formed but never carried out. Children that were strangled at the birth, desires that never were brought into living acts, desires that sprang up like the mushroom in the night and like the fungus were swept away like smoke from the chimney that stopped as soon as the fire had gone out. Oh, brethren, if these are your desires, they are not practical. They do not come of God. But if your desires have made you give up your drunkenness, have compelled you to renounce your theater going, have constrained you to seek God with full purpose of heart, have brought you to give up one lust after another. Take comfort. You're in the right road if your desires are practical desires. You can tell these desires by their urgency. Ah, you want to be saved, some of you, but it must be this day next week. But when the Holy Ghost speaks, he says, today, if you'll hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. It must be now or never. Today, give me grace. Today, give me mercy. Today, give me pardon. Some of you hope to be saved before you die, before the pit closes on you. You hope Jesus Christ will look down upon you in some years to come. You've not sat down for many years, I suppose, but it is always in the distant, hazy future. But the true desire is now. Does the poor man who stands upon the scaffold with a rope around his neck say, uh, pardon me in a year's time? No, 
No, he's afraid he shall the next minute be launched into eternity. He who feels his danger will cry now. He who wants Christ really will cry now. He who is spiritually awakened will cry out now or never. What, sinner, will it do to postpone salvation? Does thine heart tell thee it will do by and by? What? When the fire is just coming through the boards of thy little chamber? What? When thy ship has struck upon the rock and is filling? Yes, she's filling. While the fire at the other end is rushing up. And fire and water together are seeking thy destruction. Wilt thou say tomorrow? Why, thou mayest be dead. Ere tomorrow's sun has risen, tomorrow, where is it? In the devil's calendar, it's not written in any book on earth. Tomorrow, some fancied islet in the far-off sea that the mariner has never reached. Tomorrow, it's the fool's desire, which he'll never gain. Like a will-o'-the-wisp, it dances before him, but only lands him in the marshes of distress. Tomorrow, there is no such thing. It is God's. If there is such a day, ours it cannot be. Tillotson well remarks, to, to be always intending to live a new life, but never to find time to set about it, this is as if a man should put off eating and drinking and sleeping from one day and night to another till he is starved and destroyed. But you say, if I have desired God... Why have I not obtained my desire before now? Why has not God granted my request? Well, in the first place, you've hardly a right to ask the question. For God has a right to grant your petition or not as he pleases. Far be it from man to say to God, what do you do? He is the sovereign. He has power to do what he will. But since thine anxiety has dictated the question, let my anxiety attempt to answer it. Perhaps God has not granted thy desire because he wishes thine own profit thereby. He designs to show thee more of the desperate wickedness of thine heart that in the future thou mayest fear to trust it. He wants thee to see more of the blackness of darkness and of the horrible pit of sin that like a burnt child thou mayest shun the fire forever. He lets thee go down into the dungeon that thou mayest prize liberty the better when it comes. And he's keeping thee waiting, moreover, that thy longings may be quickened. He knows that delay will fan the desire, and that if he keeps you waiting, it will not be a loss to you, but will gain you much, because you'll see your necessity more clearly. Seek him more earnestly. Cry more bitterly, and your heart will be more in earnest after him. And besides, poor soul, God keeps thee waiting, perhaps in order that he may display the riches of his grace more fully to thee at the last. I believe that some of us who were kept by God a long while before we found him, loved him better perhaps than we should have done if we had received him directly. And we can preach better to others. We can speak more of his loving kindness and tender mercy. John Bunyan could not have written as he did if he had not been dragged about by the devil for many years. Ah, I love that picture of dear old Christian. I know when I first read that book, Pilgrim's Progress, and saw the old woodcut in it of Christian carrying the burden on his back, I felt so interested for the poor fellow that I thought I should jump with joy when, after the poor creature had carried his burden so long, he at last got rid of it. Ah, beloved, and God may make you and me carry the burden for a long time till he takes it off, that we may leap all the higher with joy when we do get deliverance. For depend upon it, there's no poor penitent who loves mercy so well as he who has been faring for it for a season. Perhaps this is the reason why God keeps you waiting. One more thought here. Perhaps, perhaps it has come already. I think some of you are pardoned and you don't even know it. 
I think some of you are forgiven, though you are expecting something wonderful as a sign which you will never receive. Persons have got the strangest notions in the world about conversion. I've never heard persons tell the queerest tales. I have, that is. I've heard persons tell the weirdest tales you could imagine about how they were converted. Though, of course, I, I didn't believe them. And I fancy some of you think you will have a kind of electric shock, a sort of galvanism or something or other will pass through you such as you never had before. Don't be expecting any miracles now. If you will not think you are pardoned till you get a vision, you will have to wait many a year. Now, some people fancy they are not pardoned because they have never heard a voice in their ears. Now, I should be very sorry to have my salvation dependent on a text of Scripture applied to my heart. I, I should be afraid that the devil had applied it or that it was the wind whistling behind me. I want something more sure than that. For perhaps you are forgiven and you do not yet know it. God spoke in the tidings of mercy to your spirit, yet you've not heard it, because you're saying it can't be that. If you could but sit down and think of this, quote, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, end of quote. But methinks you would find that, after all, you are not, find that you're not excluded. There's no great need for any of these miraculous things that you're reckoning upon. God may have given them to some of his people, but he's never promised them. Perhaps then the question may be answered by saying, the pardon is there, but you do not know it. Oh, may God speak loudly in your soul that you may know really and certainly that he has forgiven you. But there's one more serious inquiry, and it is, will God grant my desire at last? Yes, poor soul, verily he will. It is quite impossible that you should have desired God and should be lost if you have desired him with the desire that I have described. For I will suppose that you should go down into the chambers of the lost with the desire still in your spirit. When you entered within the gates, you would have to say, I desired mercy of God and he would not give it to me. I sought grace at the hands of Jesus and he would not give it. You know what would be said at once. Satan would be so pleased. Ah, he would say, here's a sinner that perished praying. God has not kept his promise. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here's one that did it, and he's lost. <laughs> ah, how they would howl for joy in hell. They'd sing a blasphemous song against the Almighty God that one poor desiring soul should be there. I tell you one thing. I've heard many wicked things in my life. I've heard many men swear and blaspheme God till I've trembled. There's one thing I never did hear a man say yet, and I think God would scarcely permit any man to perpetrate such a lie. I never heard even a drunken man say, I sincerely sought God with full purpose of heart, yet he's not heard me. He will not answer me, but has cast me away. I scarcely think it possible Although I know that men can be infinitely wicked, and that any man could utter such an abominable falsehood as that. At any rate, I can say I never heard it. And I believe there are some of you who can say I've been young and now I'm old, and I'm old and I've never seen one penitent sinner who could say in despair, I am not saved. I've sought God and he will not hear me. He's cast me away from his face. He will not give me mercy. I, and I think as long as you live, you will not meet such a case. Then why should you be the first one? Why, poor penitent, should you be the first? Do you think you're a chosen mark for all the arrows of the Almighty? Has he set you for a butt against which he will direct all the thunderbolts of his vengeance? Are you to be the first instance in which mercy fails? Are you to be the one who shall first outdo the infinity of love? Oh, say not so. Despair is mad. But for one instant, gather up thy reason, thou despairing one. Would God wish to see thee damned? Hath he not said, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, but would rather that he should turn to me and live? Do you think it would be a pleasure to the Almighty to have your blood? Oh, far be it from you to conceive it. 
Do you not think that he loves to pardon? Has he not said himself he delighteth in mercy? Is it not written, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts? What advantage would it be to God to destroy your soul? Would it not be more to his honor to save you? Ah, assuredly, because you would sing his praise in heaven, would you not? Yes, but, but recollect the best argument I can use with you is this. Um, do not suppose, do you suppose, that God would give his son to die for sinners and yet would not save sinners? It's written in the scriptures that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. You are a sinner. You feel you are a sinner. You know it. Then he came to save you. Only believe that. As a poor penitent, you have a right to believe it. If you were a Pharisee, you would well, you wouldn't have that right. But as a penitent, humble, contrite soul, you have a right to believe in Jesus. The Pharisee has none, for it is never written that he came to save the righteous. And if he believed he did, he would believe a lie. But every man who is a sinner, every man who lays claim to that title has a right to believe that Christ died for him. <laughs> and not only so, but it is the truth. He came into the world for a certain purpose. What he came for, he will do. He came into the world to save sinners. And now it's written, whosoever believeth on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. When last Friday I had the honor of preaching to many thousand persons in the open air, such an assembly as I never dreamed of seeing, such a vast number as I could scarcely have fancied would have met for any religious purpose, I, I noticed a most singularly powerful echo, constantly taking up the last words of my sentences and sending them back as if some great giant voice had spoken to confirm what I had said. When I had repeated the words, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, the echo said, Saved! And when I proceeded, He that believeth not shall be damned, I heard the echo gently say, Damned! Methinks this morning I hear that echo. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and the saints above cry, Saved! Hark! How they sing before the throne! Hark! How your glorified parents and your immortalized relatives cry, Saved! Hear you not the echo as it echoes from the blue sky of heaven? Saved! And O oh, doleful thought, when I utter those words, He that believeth not shall be damned. There comes up that dread word, damned, from the place where there are hollow groans and sullen moans and shrieks of tortured ghosts. God grant that you may never know what it is to be damned, God gives you to believe now. For today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts.